Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. I was doing research into another video topic and I came across a case that once I saw it, I really wanted to share it with you guys. And that's because this is a great illustration of some things not to do in the courts or in life in general. So you might want to pour yourself a drink for this one. I've still got a lot I got to do tonight or I'd be doing the same, but let's have a look at this one. You'll see why it gets a little off the rails real quick. Uh, this is the case of the Queen and Glenn Winningham Fern, and it's a 2014 decision, but everything that was a bad idea in 2014 in terms of this decision is still a real bad idea today. So this is still very relevant. All right, it begins with a little bit of a, a soliloquy here, and you'll see why once we get into what's actually going on here. But they start off with, a fundamental and pervasive feature of Canadian society is the universal applicability of the rule of law. An effective criminal justice system is a key aspect of the rule of law. This system must ensure that adjudication is timely and impartial, free of outside influence, and that it recognizes and enforces due process of law and the rights of the accused. The rule of law also maintains that all individuals, no matter their beliefs or standing, are accountable under the law. When they absent themselves for the purpose of impeding or frustrating the due process of the law with an intention to avoid its consequences, that person's purpose will not be fulfilled and his intention will be defeated. All right, that's a, a bit of a heavy uh, bit there, but you'll see what they're talking about fairly quickly. As a result of events which occurred on October 11th and October 12th, 2013, at the Canada-US border near Coots, Alberta. Now I'm gonna note, this is not that Coots case that you've seen in the news recently. This is from 2014. Um, Coots is just a town with a big border crossing, and so they're a town that gets a whole bunch of uh, border-related cases. Uh, there's various, uh, here in, near Edmonton, the town of Leduc gets a bunch of sort of border-related cases because that's the jurisdiction for the Edmonton International Airport. So that's the only reason why Coots gets a lot of mention in these things. Anyway, carrying on. The accused Glenn Winningham Fern was charged with smuggling and importing into Canada overcapacity magazines, push daggers, a blowgun, and a canister of pepper spray, contrary to the Customs Act and contrary to the Criminal Code. He was also charged with making a false or deceptive statement, contrary to the Customs Act. Now, whether you think these things should be banned, and I kind of think not, because, yeah, um, some of these are real silly, like blowgun. Um, I have never been able to find a blowgun homicide or even assault in Canada, but uh, that's actually what I was researching. But... Uh, Regardless of your thoughts on whether these are good laws, they're still laws. And, you know, even if a law is dumb, you can be punished pretty severely for violating it. So that's uh, kind of a thing here. So upon attending in provincial court to answer these charges, Mr. Fern refused to enter a plea. And as a result, a plea of not guilty was entered on his behalf. And the trial was scheduled for March 3rd to 6th, 2014. Uh, why so long? Because they've got a whole bunch of witnesses. That's why this one's going to be a four-day trial. Um, and also because of Mr. Fern himself. I'm sure that they expected that things would take a little longer because he's a bit uh, difficult. Uh, people sometimes try this where they say, oh, I'm, you know, you want me to plead guilty or not guilty? I'm, I'm not going to plead. I refuse. And all that happens is the court says, okay, um, that, that's a plea of not guilty. Done. Moving on. Um. The court is fairly re resilient to these kind of shenanigans. So, so Mr. Fern brought an application before the Court of Queen's Bench in an attempt to halt the prosecution of these charges in provincial court. We'll have a look at that as well a little later, although that one's real long, so we'll just skim it. His application was heard by the Honorable uh, Mr. Justice W.A. Tileman. His application was dismissed with oral reasons, followed by written reasons reported at Fern and Canada Customs. In addition to the application Mr. Fern brought before the Court of Queen's Bench, he also filed a series of applications before the Provincial Court in connection with this matter. And here's where you start seeing things go a little sideways. So one, demand to dismiss and counterclaim, filed October 24th, 2013. General demur and counterclaim, filed November 7th, 2013. Notice of void judgment and notice of non-suit, filed December 4th, 2013. Demand for a common law jury trial, filed February 11th, 2014. Notice of objection and non-consent to this proceeding under Roman civil law in your show trial and notice of contempt by affidavit, 
filed February 11th, 2014. A series of notices of constitutional question filed February 25th, 2014. Declaration of fraud filed February 25th, 2014. Declaration of fraud filed March 3rd, uh, 2014. So this is one of these moments where you're like, oh, I know exactly what this guy is. This guy is a sovereign citizen or a freeman on the land or one of those kinds of uh, people. And let's see how that works out for him. Because, yeah. And I know I'm going to get some hate mail over this one because there's some people who comment who sort of follow these kinds of beliefs. These beliefs never work. They just don't. Um, and let's see how it works out for Mr. Fern. And I think it's worth noting here. I'm just going to stop. Uh, Mr. Fern is not just some random guy here. We're actually going to get into the depths of how DP is involved in all of this. But I just want to show you this because Mr. Fern... Uh, sells or used to none of this stuff is available but a bunch of books on sovereignty so he's a sovereign citizen and all of this is available on amazon as well as apparently a book on trump and whether or not he's a true american patriot so this guy isn't just like some guy who's fallen into the rabbit hole and you know believes this stuff he's also selling it to others so if you're deciding on whether or not to buy something like this, you can look at how well it works for Mr. Fern and, you know, weigh that into your consideration as to whether that's a useful use of your money. All right. So they say, although Mr. Fern refused to stand at the commencement of these court proceedings, uh, sometimes sovereign citizen types thinks that that means something if they stand up or not. All it just means is, you know, the court asks you to rise, so you do it. Um, he, with some reluctance, confirmed that he was the person named in the information before the court, and the trial commenced. The parties were then asked if there were any preliminary applications to be made. So these are applications that are made just at the outset of trial, and it's very common that there are some made, um, and the big one that is almost always made is the next one. The Crown responded by, respon uh, by applying for an exclusion of witnesses, which was granted. Uh, what this means, and this is really common, is you just want the court to be cleared of anyone who's going to be testifying. We have open courts. You can go and sit in the courtroom, but maybe not if you're going to testify later because you don't want, you know, you don't want a situation where the witnesses are all in agreement as to what was said in court because they all watched each other. Uh, so that's just an important fair trial thing, and that's why that was granted. Mr. Fern, on the other hand, applied to have a trial by jury. And for a lot of people, you might be saying, okay, well, why is that a, a big deal? Well, after hearing brief submissions, this application was rejected as the Crown had proceeded by way of summary conviction process, and there was no right in law for the matter to proceed by way of jury. Um, some of my viewers are American, and in the U.S., they run a lot more jury trials than they do here in Canada. Uh, here in Canada, for many trials on less serious matters, you don't have a right to a trial by jury. Um, he was also asking for a trial by, uh, a common law jury. Um, yeah, that just wasn't going to happen. He doesn't have access to a jury trial in this matter. So Mr. Fern then made no further applications, but instead attempted to disrupt the court. He purported to fire me and indicated that he was taking his box of materials and leaving, which he did. <laughs> You're fired, judge. I mean... Obviously not, right? This is obviously not a tactic that actually works. Because if you could just fire the judge, I mean, you know, different judges have different perspectives in court. And, you know, if you could just say, oh, judge, you're fired, um, you'd have lawyers all the time being like, I don't like this judge, you're fired. Like, this is not, uh, you know, Trump's old game show. Yeah. But uh, when that didn't work, he picks up his box of stuff and takes his ball home. Let's see how that works out for him. The court then recessed for a few moments to determine if Mr. Fern was going to return and to give the Crown an opportunity to consider their position. Spoiler alert, he weren't coming back. When the court returned, Mr. Fern was not present, and the court re recessed until 10 a.m. to again determine whether Mr. Fern was going to voluntarily return. He did not. So counsel for the Crown applied for a warrant on Form 7, making reference to Section 475 of the Criminal Code. A warrant was issued, and the court recessed until 1 p.m. to determine if Mr. Fern was going to reappear voluntarily 
or to determine whether the warrant could be executed. So when you walk out on your trial, they issue a warrant for your arrest. And they did so, and then they waited until 1 p.m. to see, hey, maybe the cops will find this guy and drag him back in and we can uh, start. And at that point, you're going to be having your entire trial probably, you know, being kept there by force, which is a lot less fun than just sitting in the chair, right? So when the court recommenced at 1 p.m., Mr. Fern was not present, and the Crown applied to continue with the trial ex parte on the grounds that it was no longer in the interest of justice to wait for, uh, to await the appearance of the accused. Now, what an ex parte trial means is without one of the parties. Oh, uh, Mr. Fern would not be there for this trial. They're going to run the trial without him, and you kind of want to be there at your own trial because how else do you defend yourself? It's going to be real hard. Now, there are provisions in Canada that allow for ex parte trials, particularly on summary conviction offenses. On some more serious offenses, they won't do that because they'd say that would be unfair and it's too serious. So in, on those trials, what they'll do is they'll just wait until they apprehend you and then keep you in custody and make sure you show up that way. Uh, another reason why they might do it on summary conviction offenses is because let's say they... Uh, they schedule you for a trial on, say, you know, March 1st, and it's a one-day trial and you don't show up, well, it might be for something where your expected penalty is a fine, but if they decide to hold you in custody rather than just running the trial ex parte, uh, you might be held in custody for months instead of a small fine. So that's another reason why they might run an ex parte trial. All right, so the judge uh, directs that the trial proceed ex parte for the following reasons. And he's, you know, this is a court, so when they do something, they explain why they're doing it and justify that decision. So first, Mr. Fern, by his conduct in court, displayed disregard for court process in both his language and mannerisms. After he left the courtroom and did not return, I concluded his actions were indicative of a desire to delay and disrupt the proceedings, and he did so with the intent of impeding or frustrating the trial with the intention of avoiding its consequences. The court doesn't like that. The court really, you know, doesn't like you screwing with the, the orderly flow of the court, and especially if they think that you're, you know, if he was leaving because he you know, got a text and yelled something like, oh my God, and ran out without providing any explanation, the court might have been like, maybe somebody died? Maybe somebody is injured? You know, but here it looks like he was actively trying to prevent the trial from happening. That's a different kind of scenario. Uh, the applications which Mr. Fern had filed with the provincial court in this manner were the same or substantially the same as the arguments advanced before, and rejected by Mr. Justice Tilleman in Fern and Canada Customs. So remember how I mentioned there was that application in the meantime uh, that rejected all the arguments he wanted to bring here, so eh, yeah. The language used in the applications that Mr. Fern filed with the provincial court display a total disregard for the process of the court and a total lack of respect for court process and court officials. We'll have a look at a little snippet of that language a little later. Preliminary applications. So. Although Mr. Fern was not present when the trial recommenced, counsel for the Crown sought an order dismissing all of his applications. The applications were dismissed for the following reasons, and this can be really summed up in a real quick phrase, which is that they were dismissed because they're bullshit. But um, let's sort of look at the reasons why the court says, because they're not just going to say, this is a whole pile of bullshit and we're not going to, you know, we're not going to entertain it. So they say, one, those applications which related to constitutional questions were not served upon the Crown in a timely fashion as required by the Judicature Act of Alberta. If you want to make charter arguments or constitutional arguments, you're required to give the Crown advance notice so that they can prepare for that. And he didn't do that, so that's one ground. Mr. Fern, when first asked about preliminary applications, only made reference to his request for a jury trial and to no others. In addition, he did not return to court and so did not pursue them. As such, I deem them to be abandoned. If you don't pursue your legal arguments, the court can say, well, you didn't argue this point, so we're not going to listen to it. Uh, three, there was no, or at least an insufficient evidentiary foundation for his applications. You kind of need evidence. 
For Mr. Fern's applications were the same or substantially similar as those, as those argued before Mr. Justice Tilleman and were carefully analyzed by Justice Tilleman and rejected. So you already tried this and it was already <laughs> rejected, so we're not giving you another shot at it. Now, there's a bit of a discussion here on which section of the criminal code they're using for the warrant. Uh, that's really a question for... Uh, that's a really technical procedural question and frankly is not the interesting part of this case. So they go on and they run this case. The Crown uh, still calls evidence, you know, even though it's an ex parte trial, it's a trial. So the Crown still got a burden and there have been cases, although it's not rare, where the Crown has run an ex parte case and lost because they just didn't have the evidence to convince the court. So the Crown called seven witnesses, all of whom were retained or employed with Canadian, uh, the Canadian Border Services Agency, and the court still was assessing the credibility of that witness by, you know, looking at a multitude of factors, including but not limited to appearance or demeanor, ability to perceive, ability to recall, motivation. So if you've got a motivation to lie, uh, probability or plausibility, does your testimony make sense, or internal or external consistency. Uh, and that means, you know, does your testimony contradict itself or is it contradicted by other testimony from other witnesses or, ob you know, things that are obvious about the universe or other evidence that you have? Like if you have one, uh, one witness who says that he saw somebody point a gun and shoot at the person and there was a loud bang and, you know, so forth, but later another witness who recovers this firearm, uh, you know, grabs the supposed gun from him, discovers that it's actually just a piece of wood that was carved into a vaguely gun shape. Um, that would be an inter or an external inconsistency because this guy says it's a gun that shot and it turns out from other witnesses that it couldn't possibly have done so. So that's just kind of some of the things that a court will look at. So in the case at Barr, the accused was not present during the giving of evidence, and as a result, no cross-examination was conducted. The accused did not testify, and no witnesses were called on behalf of the accused. So think about this. I mean, when you have a trial ex parte because you have decided to leave, you're at a real disadvantage, because often, you know, where a witness is found to be lying, it's because of a cross-examination, which you don't get to do. And you might have all sorts of good evidence, and we can see portions of this case where uh, the, the accused might have been able to testify to something that might have helped them, but you can't do that if you're not there. All right, so there's a whole bunch of stuff, and the court basically says these witnesses seem to be good witnesses. They've got a clear recollection, they don't have any inconsistencies, um, there's one issue of continuity, but that doesn't turn out to be a big deal. Um, so the court finds their witnesses to be pretty good because of course, nobody's there making it hard for them. The crown's not cross-examining these witnesses. So of course they're going to look good. All right. So a, one of these officers is working at the border crossing and a vehicle pulls up and the officer asks for this guy's ID and gets a Canadian passport and registration. And then they run the passport into their system. And let's sort of continue on here. Uh, so this individual's name, as it appeared on the passport, was Glenn Winningham Fern. And the system noted that he was categorized as armed and dangerous. Now, that's a bad thing to come up when you are crossing the border. If, I mean, short of like active warrant for arrest or disqualified from entry, no, wait, armed and dangerous is way worse than disqualified from entry. Disqualified from entry, they probably just turn you around and say, off you go. But armed and dangerous is going to is gonna get people interested. That's, uh, that's one of those things that's going to get people's eyebrows going up and uh, starting to take some steps. So, and if you're wondering how he gets to be declared armed and dangerous, well, we're going to hear about that too. This is a wonderful case of just this guy making bad life choices his entire life long. All right. Officer Patching asked Mr. Fern a series of standard questions, which included the question, do you have any firearms or weapons? To which Mr. Fern responded, I do not believe in them. This is a bad answer at the border. 
you know, when you're asked a yes or no question, the answer you give should be a yes or a no. And, you know, when you're talking about these sovereign citizen guys, these guys don't believe in our laws, notwithstanding that the laws exist. They are a thing that is out there. So, you know, when he says he doesn't believe in firearms or weapons, does he just not believe that it's possible for something to be a weapon? I don't know. But this is an answer that raises some questions. And they say, noting that Mr. Fern was evasive in his answer, he again asked Mr. Fern if he possessed any firearms or weapons, to which Mr. Fern replied no. He also noted that Mr. Fern was evasive in one other question. So, having been called on it by the border guard, you know, the border guard is like, just answer the bloody question. Uh, he tries this same thing again in, on one other question with respect to whether or not he possessed any alcohol or tobacco, to which Mr. Fern responded, I do not drink or smoke. Again, that's not an answer to what was asked. People sometimes think that they're being clever with this kind of non-answer or evasive answer. Um, people try this in court all the time, and it looks real bad. Uh, when a witness does this, when you are asking them a question in court, ooh, that's when I start to have fun. That's when it's like, ooh, we are going to have fun with this. So, yeah, this is... Uh, this is not a good move. So upon being asked the question again, Mr. Fern responded in the negative. Keep in mind, like, I don't drink or smoke doesn't mean you're not bringing across booze. Uh, you know, I do drink, I don't smoke, but I have brought tobacco products across a border, you know, declaring them and all of that because the person I wanted to give them to as a gift. So, yeah. All right. In light of his armed and dangerous status, and in light of uh, the evasive nature of his answers to the two questions, Officer Patching directed Mr. Fern to drive over and park his vehicle and trailer in Bay 1 for the purpose of conducting a secondary search and in order to respond to the armed and dangerous indication. And let's be honest here. Um, whether or not he answered those questions in an evasive fashion, I'm pretty sure he was going to get the full, full deal here, uh, simply because armed and dangerous like that is a big thing here um but the evasive questions or the evasive answers certainly don't help and they won't help him when he gets into court all right so the officer then starts basically letting everyone know like we got a problem this is a big deal so while mr fern was driving his vehicle over to bay one officer patching was instructed to close the traveler lane and officers gathered to respond to the armed and dangerous threat so Everybody stay away. And I'm sure that the person behind them in the lane is like, oh, why are they closing this lane? This is such a frustrating thing. Well, sometimes it's for good reasons. Think about that when you're at the border. You know, sometimes you never know what's going on. It might be, hey, we think this guy is bringing over, uh, you know, one too many bottles of booze. Or it might be that they think this guy is a real bad problem. All right. Border Services Officer Mackenzie Meehan led the response team. The bad thing when response team is being used, you know, if you're facing a response team, that is a bad thing. He directed two officers to overlook Fern's vehicle, while three officers accompanied him to extract Mr. Fern from the vehicle. Overlook in this context is going to mean that they've got guns pointed at the vehicle, you know, as cover. Uh, these officers approached Fern's vehicle with firearms drawn. Officer Meehan directed Mr. Fern to exit the vehicle and assume a prone position on the ground. He was then handcuffed and taken back to the border service vehicle where he was frisked. Both the handcuffing and the frisking of Mr. Fern was were a result of what the officers believed was necessary for officer safety. Um, yeah, being declared armed and dangerous at the border it means you are going to have a very bad time when you cross. Officer Meehan then accessed the customs database to read the contents and narrative of the armed and dangerous label as it related to Mr. Fern and, lo and noted that it was based in part upon written statements which were alleged to have been provided by Mr. Fern to a Canadian Border Services point of entry. Why would you put stuff like that in writing? Oh right, because this guy's making bad life choices. Carrying on. It noted that he would resist an unlawful arrest and felt entitled to use deadly force if necessary, and that he was willing to die for his cause. Of all the letters you should write to the Canadian Border Service, this is on the top of the ones you should not write. Ugh. Yeah, doing this when I've still got work to do and 
thus can't drink is a real mistake. Um, it also noted that a couple of years previous, he had been stopped at the Canadian border port and returned to the U.S. because he possessed two unregistered firearms. Um, this happens a lot. Um, people come up from the U.S. Uh, with guns and they often run into trouble because they don't understand that Canada's got very different rules than the U.S. Um, he apparently just got turned around, which is good for him. Uh, that doesn't always happen to people. Sometimes it results in some big, uh, big charges. So the evidence of Officer Meehan in connection with his uh, reading of these contents and narrative was not admitted for the purpose of establishing the truth of these matters, but rather to assist Mr. Meehan in assessing the risk posed by Mr. Fern and to assist in deciding an appropriate course of action. Now this is because this is a hearsay issue. That's what the court is identifying. Uh, when the officer is saying, here's what I saw in the database, uh, the court isn't going to admit that for the truth of what happened in those cases, right? It's just to assist the court in understanding whether the officer was taking reasonable steps at that point. Because had Mr. Fern had a proper lawyer or was at least there making proper arguments, he might have been able to argue that there was something improper about the search that went down. Um, that is a potential viable angle of, you know, of attack on this case, um, depending on what was in the disclosure, which I don't have. But they did use a lot of force in taking him down, so the question is, was that reasonable under the circumstances? Given the letter he sent? Probably. Um, yeah. Carrying on. After having read the narrative, he went to the cell where Mr. Fern was located and advised him that he was being detained as a result of a suspicion that he was smuggling under the Customs Act. So at this point, they think he might be smuggling, but they don't know for sure. They're detaining him so that they can search his vehicle. During the course of the search of the trailer, Border Services Officer Van Dyke discovered a black ammunition box in the entertainment center. In the box, he discovered what he believed to be two push daggers, which he was of the opinion were prohibited weapons under the criminal code. And one of the dumbest prohibited weapons, although there's a lot of competition in that field. So uh, at this point, uh, he contacted Officer Meehan by radio. Officer Meehan attended and examined the push daggers and then returned to the cell where Mr. Fern was located and formally arrested him for smuggling under the Customs Act. Now there's a question as to whether or not Mr. Fern was actually arrested before because he's sitting in a cell. You know, he's not just being detained, he's, he was handcuffed and he's in cells. So, yeah, but regardless, um, there wasn't any, he's not making a charter argument here, he's making crazy arguments, so, and he's not even there to make them. So during the course of the search conducted, uh, they discovered the following items. Two 50 round boxes of 45 ACP ammunition, one 47 round uh, box of Federal Reserve 45 ammunition, uh, two, four 20 round boxes of, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if that's just the brand getting screwed up, two by 62 by 39 millimeters and nine loose rounds of ammunition, uh, two 50 round boxes of Magtech 45 ACP, three 50 round boxes of Bitterroot Valley 38 H&R ammunition. Um, sometimes there's going to be errors in what they're saying because courts will often get firearms and ammunition stuff wrong. Uh, some more 32 ACP, 20 rounds of 45 automatic, nine high capacity magazines and one high capacity drum magazine, two push daggers, one pepper spray, and one Terminator blowgun. I'm assuming that's a brand name because, you know, I watched the Terminator movies and I never saw a blowgun come up. But regardless, I mean, maybe I missed it. Somebody's, if I did, somebody's going to be in the comments going, hey, at this timestamp in this movie, somebody uses a blowgun. But I mean, usually people are fighting Terminators with shotguns and, you know, vats of uh, molten metal. Spoilers, sorry. Uh, right. So, however, the push daggers, the pepper spray, and the blowgun are all prohibited weapons in Canada because, you know, apparently these are some sort of problem on our streets. Okay, carrying on. So they do some testing of these things, find that they are what they look like, and um, 
So we're going to have a look at sort of what's going on here in terms of the trial. I'm going to skim over this a lot just in terms of discussing the issues. Uh, the first, there was an issue of continuity of the items. And this one, the court rejects, but continuity basically means uh, if the court is saying that, you know, this particular item is a thing you had and is a thing that is illegal. So let's assume that you are charged with, you know, a drug offense. And the main, you know, basis for that is a baggie of what they say is cocaine. But let's say the officer seizes a baggie of what is, you know, a white powder from you. And then it goes to the police station and then there are no records of what happens next but somehow a baggie of a white substance ends up at the drug lab they test it they find that it's cocaine and they say that's yours well now there's a continuity problem because the question you have is really one of is the baggie that they seized from you the same one that made it to the drug lab or did something funny go on uh, sometimes stuff happens. So there were some issues in terms of inconsistency on the continuity. However, the court ultimately says that there's not really a plausible basis to think that there could have been confusion with the evidence. And so they say they do not raise a reasonable doubt about the exhibit's integrity, i.e. that these exhibits are what they say they seized. And uh, they had officers who testified that the items that were brought into court were the same ones that were seized in court. So they say, for example, Officer Van Dyke was able to identify certain particularities regarding the push dagger, which he also confirmed existed when he examined them in court. So the court rejects this argument. Uh, were the items seized prohibited devices in the case of the magazines and prohibited weapons in the case of the blowgun, canister of pepper spray and push daggers? And they determined that yes, they were because the officers say they were and nobody's there to contradict that. Did he possess the prohibited devices and prohibited weapons? And possession gets to be an interesting legal concept. Uh, there, we've got lots of charges in law that ban you from possessing certain things. Um, you know, whether that's drugs, whether that's bad pictures, whether that's certain weapons, um, proceeds of crime, all sorts of things it's illegal for you to have. And... So the question then becomes, what does it mean to possess something? You know, am I in possession of this pen? And you might think that this is a silly question, except sometimes it comes up in weird circumstances. Let's say the cops search my house while I'm not here. And let's say this pen is somehow an illegal pen. Um, and so the court wants to know, did I have possession of this pen? And, you know, if it's physically in my hand it's pretty easy for them to prove it but let's say they just find it somewhere in my house well okay now it's a little more difficult but they know i live here but my wife also lives here maybe it's her pen so these become really complicated questions in some circumstances uh possession comes down to you know issues typically of knowledge and control so knowledge you can't possess something that you don't know exists and so the circumstance where this might come up is, let's say I'm hitchhiking by the side of the road. Some guy picks me up and I think he's kind of sketchy looking, but you know what? It's raining, it's 10 degrees below and somehow still raining. Uh, my example's not that great, but you know, I'm miserable. I just want to get into a warm car and get to where I'm going. And not long after the vehicle, you know, gets pulled over by the cops and they find that there's a handgun in the glove compartment. I didn't know that handgun was there. Assuming the court agrees that I didn't know that handgun was there, I can't be convicted of possession because it's not my handgun. Uh, the other aspect is control. Or So were you, are you in a position to exercise some degree of control of the item? You know, in the case of the handgun, um, could I throw it out the window and get rid of it? Well, if I knew about it, maybe. But, you know, let's say there's a big angry guy next to me who's going to get real upset if I start messing with that handgun. You know, if if I go and start opening the glove box, he's probably going to, you know, throw some hands at best. Uh, I may not be in control of that handgun in that circumstance. You know, so, um, and the same thing of like, if you come over and I'm playing with this pen, um, you might know that the pen is there but you might not be in possession. You know, it might be that you say, hey, can I have your pen? And I say, no, I really like this pen. It's a good pen. Get your own. Um, so that's another control issue. 
and I'm really simplifying it here because that's not really the main issue in this video, but I just kind of want to explain why this is a, a, why the court is asking this question when they find the stuff in the guy's trailer, right? All right, so there's a whole bunch of, you know, discussion here, and I'm going to skip over most of it because, again, this is really more of a how the court deals with sovereign citizen craziness rather than a possession kind of case. So one thing they note here is, in addition, the Crown notes that Mr. Fern was evasive in his answers to Officer Patching and lied about whether he possessed any weapons or firearms and relies upon the Ontario Court of Appeal. I don't think this is the strongest argument because, you know, this one is kind of one that says you're guilty whether or not you did it or you you didn't. You know, lied about whether he possessed any weapons or firearms. I mean, that could be taken as a truthful answer that he didn't think he had any guns. Um, let's say I'm driving across the border and while I'm not paying attention, somebody chucks a brick of cocaine through my window and I don't see it happening. And their notion is that they're going to stop me and carjack me later and get that brick of cocaine. So I don't know that it's there. And when the officer asks me, hey, do you have any cocaine in your vehicle? I say, no. Well, the court will might say, hey, well, that's clearly a lie because there was cocaine. And you see how this gets to be a bit of a problematic argument. Um, this one kind of presumes guilt. I don't like that element of this. Um, as much as I'm not super sympathetic to Mr. Fern, um, I don't like this. Yeah, I don't like this argument. I don't like where it goes. I think it's uh, a problem. So carrying on a little bit here. Uh, so they say, I have concluded that the Crown has established beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Fern possessed the necessary mens rea, so the guilty mind to possess these items, and that he knew their characteristics. In that regard, I rely on the following. So one, Mr. Fern was the lone occupant of a truck which was connected to and towing a travel trailer. If there's more people in the vehicle, that muddies the issue because maybe it belongs to the other guy, right? Mr. Fern was deliberately misleading to Officer Patching when he was asked if he possessed any weapons or firearms, and he responded that he did not believe in them. Fair enough. I mean, that is a, a weasel answer to it. Um, but sometimes people answer questions in weird ways. Like, that. sometimes people are just weird, and I say that as a weird person myself you might have noticed. So, yeah, okay, I'll give him this one. Uh, but I kind of, I'm making a little bit of face. So Mr. Fern, by being evasive and by subsequently lying to Officer Patching, now you're kind of assuming the guilt aspect here, uh, regarding whether he had weapons or firearms, was attempting to divert suspicion from himself. This is probative of the question as to whether he had actual knowledge that the items seized were in the trailer and whether he was aware of their characteristics. I mean, Kind of. It could go the other way on this one. But this is the finding of fact of the court, so yeah. I think the other arguments that they make here are much better arguments, that he's the only guy there. And continuing on, the travel trailer contained personal items which clearly belonged to Mr. Fern, including documents of legal import. And I, you can sort of gather what kind of documents these might be, but yeah. The prohibited items, although not found in plain view, were easily located and contained in boxes described as ammunition boxes, which by their nature are designed for the use and storage of ammunition and weapons. This suggests that they would be available to anyone who used the trailer and that the person would not have to access any special knowledge or uh, access to a secret or hidden compartment. So let's, you know, think about that. Like if you're the only occupant of a motor vehicle and they want to prove that you uh, were in possession of a shotgun found in that vehicle, it's a lot easier for them to prove that if it's sitting next to you on the passenger seat and you obviously knew that it was there as compared to say if it's in some sort of you know secret compartment that maybe you didn't know about like maybe you borrowed a vehicle and some guy has built some secret compartment um side note uh these kinds of secret compartments are often banned in a lot of jurisdictions so if you're think if you're listening to me right now and going, ooh, secret compartment, that sounds like a great idea. Not really a great idea in most places. Um, also, this goes the other way. Of uh, sometimes the courts will say, well, it was in a secret compartment, so clearly, you know, this involves some planning and some sophistication, and obviously, he must have known that it was there. Um, the ammunition boxes themselves were not locked, so he could have looked in them at any time. 
Uh, the ammunition boxes and thus the permitted items were located in two different locations, making it easier for him to find them. Uh, there were other weapons, namely knives, that, although not prohibited, were contained in the same ammunition box. He's keeping a lot of stuff in there. So I also note that the officers could not open the trailer with any of the keys discovered in the cab of the truck and had to gain entry to the trailer with a crowbar. There is no evidence, uh, however, that Mr. Fern could not or did not enter the trailer. In fact, evidence exists to the contrary, namely the location of personal items, including legal documents in the trailer. Now, I mean... This is something that Mr. Fern could possibly have testified about. And, you know, you got to be truthful in your testimony in court. But I don't know the circumstances. Maybe Mr. Fern had somebody else pack this trailer for him and locked it. And he wasn't able to actually go in it himself. Um, and especially if they hadn't found his personal documents in there, it could have been like, listen, you know, this is a trailer full of my buddy's stuff. I, I don't, I mean, these are circumstances that come up. But Mr. Fern, because he because he buggered off and didn't actually run this trial, isn't in a position to explain what was going on here. Um, and some of those explanations might have hurt him or might have helped him. It really depends. I don't know his personal circumstances here, but I can at least contemplate scenarios where it might be um, where, you know, there might have been a defense there, but he can't raise it. So I note that the registration document that purported to belong to the trailer does not describe Mr. Fern as the owner. Instead, it describes a corporation. That particular document, however, is not completed and on the face of it indicates it is void. That's kind of weird. The registration for the truck was also in the name of the same corporation and Mr. Fern clearly had possession and control over it. As a result, I do not believe anything turns on that document. Now, I wonder about this corporation registration, but we got no information on that. So I don't know if this is some sort of zany scheme or just a paperwork oops so as a result i am satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the only rational inference that can be drawn from the circumstantial evidence is that mr fern had control of the items and the knowledge of their prohibited status and characteristics now important point of law here um you don't actually have to know that something is banned in order to run afoul of this all you need to know is the characteristics of it that are relevant for the legal consideration so let's say um, you call a lawyer and that lawyer wrongly explains to you that, you know, this would be false, uh, that a push dagger is a legal item to possess in Canada. You know, maybe you call somebody who doesn't do criminal law. You call somebody who, you know, just solely does real estate and they misremember things from law school. Um, you go to the border and you say, I don't have anything illegal. And, you know, you believe that in your heart, uh, but I do have these knives and you know that they are push daggers in the sense of their construction. Um, that would be enough for the court to determine that you had, you know, a sufficient mens rea there because you knew that they were push daggers and you should have known the law as to what they say. Um, but let's say, you know, we can flip this around. Let's say you know that push daggers are illegal and you are a knife dealer. You've bought, um, you know, a, a thousand knives and they're all individually packaged in boxes. And on the box, it shows like a standard fixed blade knife of a type that would be legal in Canada. But somebody screwed up at the factory and they put push daggers in those boxes. So you know that push daggers are, legal, are illegal, but you think that those uh, knives that you're carrying don't have those characteristics you're surprised when the border guard opens them up and is like hey buddy what's this that would be a situation of you not knowing the the characteristics and therefore that would be a defense all right i'm getting kind of into the weeds here so let's carry on here because there's a lot more crazy that we can talk about here so and there's more actual procedural history to this so in conclusion, I found that the Crown has established beyond a reasonable doubt all the essential elements of each of the nine counts that he's been charged with, and there will be findings of guilt in each case. So his tactic of getting up and leaving doesn't save him. He gets convicted without him being there. And there's going to be more court proceedings without him being there, because the next one is also the case of the Queen and Fern, but it happens right afterwards. Now I'm going to go over this one real quick. Uh, what happens in this case, and this is a follow-up case, is the uh, the court is going to be addressing what's called the Kynapple Principle. 
And so what happens here is Counsel for the Crown was invited to make submissions with respect to whether there should be a conditional stay on any of the charges as a result of the rule against multiple convictions. He submitted that there should be a conditional stay on counts 1 through 4 and that conviction should be entered on counts 5 through 9. And the court agrees and indicated that they would provide written reasons. So essentially, Mr. Fern, having been found, you know, guilty on all counts, now gets stays of proceedings that kill counts 1 through 4. And you might be saying, why would they do that? Well, there's a rule that basically says they can only convict you once for the same specific offense. And so the real common example of this is that there are two separate offenses in the criminal code, one for operating a vehicle, which they now call a conveyance in the law, while impaired. And that's impaired to any degree by any amount of alcohol, so long as it affects your driving or by any other drug. So, uh, you know, that's a one offense. And there's also an offense of operating a conveyance while the, your blood alcohol is more than 80 milligrams of alcohol in 100 milliliters of blood. So the over 80 offense. Now, you might be in a situation where they convict you of both because the impaired driving one relates to your actual, you know, how you function. Are you too drunk to operate a vehicle? Whereas the other one is, it doesn't matter whether or not it's affecting your function. It's just the amount of alcohol in your blood. Um, so you could be somebody who's, you know, you've just pounded your way through several bottles of vodka and you were, you know, crashing into things as you were driving and they find you guilty of both the impaired driving and the over 80 offense. Well, because both of those things are aimed at the same evil, what they'll do is you'll only actually get a conviction on one of those. Uh, they'll direct this uh, conditional stay on the other and therefore, you know, you only get punished once because it wouldn't be fair to punish you for both of those things when they're really the same thing, right? But this gets into some technical questions on some cases because, uh, for instance, let's say that same scenario, you've been drunk and you've been, you know, pinballing across parked cars. They might also charge you with dangerous driving, dangerous operation of a conveyance. And there, they wouldn't enter that because that's a different thing. You know, you're crashing into vehicles. That's dangerous. That's a bit of a different thing than just being impaired. All of this gets real technical and that's enough of that for this one, essentially. But note, even though he's not there, even though the court's not happy with him, like this guy is not the, somebody the courts would consider a friend. They're not going to say, Hey, this guy's a stand up dude that you should totally emulate. They still give him the benefit of the law. So, yeah. Anyway, um, what's the next thing that happens? Sentencing. Because, of course, he's been found guilty of a whole bunch of offenses. So, uh, the Crown, and this is, I think, a, a stand-up move on the Crown's part. The Crown says, hey, are we sure we're going to do this? Because they say, the Crown noted it might be perceived as unfair if sentencing prece proceeded in absentia. And why would they say that? Well, because sentencing is highly individualized. You know, if you're trying to determine what the appropriate punishment is, you want the court to know all the good things about you, not just the allegations in terms of the offense, but you want them to know, you know, uh, you know, is there stuff that is redeeming? Do you do stuff in the community? Are you a good person? Um, and how's he going to present that if he's not there? Well, the court says uh, the, the jurisdiction to sentence Mr. Fern in absentia is clearly established. It's not mandatory, but permissible. So they don't have to, but they can. And in this case, the court is going to, and they provide reasons. Mr. Fern attended the opening of the trial, was well aware that it was proceeding, and elected to absent himself in circumstances that could have been deemed contemptuous. So you made this call. Um, if there's consequences to it, that's on you. You fucked around you find an out. Before the trial commenced, Mr. Fern brought a series of applications before the provincial court, which could be characterized, could be, um, and were repeatedly in those other applications, um, as organized pseudo-legal commercial arguments, OPCA. So this is the general catch-all category for uh, sovereign citizen stuff, Freeman on the land stuff, um, various other theories that are out there that are all equally crap of the type that were comprehensively reviewed in the decision of Meads and Meads. 
Now I want to cover Medes and Medes one day, but it's 700 paragraphs. So that's going to be an epic video. Um, as the filing of Mr. Fern's application progressed, the contents became increasingly foul, rancorous, and severe, clearly designed to delay, defeat, and otherwise frustrate the due process of the court. It's a bad idea when you're filing things to be a jerk ass about it. All right, carrying on. Mr. Fern also filed an application in the Court of Queen's Bench, disputing the jurisdiction of the provincial court to hear and deliberate on these charges. His application was dismissed by Mr. Justice Tilleman in Fearn and Canada Customs. In that case, uh, he reviewed Mr. Fern's litigation history, and we'll look at that real briefly here too, uh, and identified a total of three Canadian and 17 U.S. actions initiated by Mr. Fern. All were dismissed as fatally flawed or otherwise abandoned. So that's not a good... Keep in mind, this guy, as I mentioned, sells his magic secrets to the public. He's like, there's lots of guys out there who will sell you all of the information you need to be just like Mr. Fern. And some of them, they'll provide it to you for free. Like they'll, hey, uh, come watch my stuff. You can get all of this information. He's got a history of, you know, zero and 20. Is that really what you want to, <laughs> what you want to emulate? All right. So all were dismissed as fatally flawed or otherwise abandoned. Uh, and when you look at the abandoned, typically they were abandoned by the court saying, listen, you got to pay a filing fee. And he goes, not doing that. So the court says, yep, that's out. Mr. Justice Tillman determined that Mr. Fern's application met the criteria for frivolous and vexatious litigation and ordered that Mr. Fern be precluded from filing anything in the Alberta Court of Queen's Bench related to the border action without first obtaining an order of that court. So frivolous and vexatious is the worst thing for the court to declare your your actions to be pretty much. It, it essentially means that you've got no merit, that your arguments are complete trash, and that they're filed for an improper purpose, that you are just trying to, uh, you know, to cause trouble. And so when that happens, one of the things that they can order is that you be limited in terms of being able to file further applications, which really cuts you off from the court. You actually have to bring an application to file something. And the court's going to see that you were declared a vexatious litigant and be like, we are real suspicious of what you're doing now. It is clear from Mr. Fern's actions as described in the uh, previous case and from his conduct in this matter that he's not interested in advancing any legitimate argument. To delay his sentencing to a future date would only accede to his desire to, to delay and disrupt the administration of justice. Basically, more of, you're trying to screw us around? We're not playing your games. We're going ahead. There is no evidence before me that would suggest there is any reasonable likelihood that if the matter is delayed, it can proceed within a reasonable time. You know, this isn't a situation where somebody's like, I can't make it this week. Can we do it next week? Um, who knows when they're going to pick this guy up? So the inescapable conclusion that I reached were that his actions were for, for the purpose of impeding or frustrating the trial and avoiding the consequences of the trial. Um, court doesn't like that. They don't like you trying to weasel out of, you know, consequences. Even though he could have potentially run an argument at his trial, there are some legally... You know, they might not have been great arguments based on his factual circumstances, but there were at least arguments that could have been made. So it cannot be said that his absence was unexplained or excusable. By his own conduct, he voluntarily excused himself. He had the opportunity to return over the last three days and did not do so. There is no miscarriage of justice to proceed with sentencing in absentia. It is correct that the court did not have the benefit of submissions by Mr. Fern. This, however, falls squarely on the shoulders of Mr. Fern. Yep, we're not going to hear your side, but that's your choice. You had the option. You chose this intentionally. So again, you know, this is different from like, I got hit by a bus and I'm in hospital, or even just you mysteriously not showing up because the court might be reluctant if, it's, if they don't have a reason for it. But here the reason is you're clearly playing some sovereign citizen Freeman on the land games. We're not going to put up with that. However, the court does do its best to look at his personal circumstances to see if there's mitigating circumstances that might reduce the sentence. So they say the personal identification documents marked as exhibits in this trial disclose that Mr. Fern was born in Alberta and uh, yeah, they give this birth date, which 
I think the courts should maybe be reluctant to do. I've already included it. This is a public document here. Um, but birth dates are more and more used as identification and as means of uh, corroborating people's identity. So I, this was back in 2014. This was maybe less of a concern, but maybe I'll do a video on courts and their protection of people's personal identifying information and whether or not we should take a different view on that. Coming soon to a channel near you. Anyway, he would therefore have been 56 years of age at the time of these offenses, as well as at the time of sentencing. That is a good thing in his favor because being old means that you are usually, and I mean, that's not super old, but it's, um, crime tends to be a young person's game. Most people who come before the courts are like 20s to 30s. So, you know, almost 60 years old is pretty old by court standards. Um, and uh, they note that when he attended at the border, he produced an L Arizona driver's license, suggesting that his present uh, presence uh, or present place of residence is Arizona. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know where he's living now. Uh, Mr. Fern appears to have dual citizenship in that he possessed both a Canadian and U.S. passport. Not super relevant, but... So, counsel for the Crown informed the court that on a previous court appearance, uh, Mr. Fern advised the court that he was an unemployed engineer and that he had a wife and children who lived in Vancouver, British Columbia. He has no Canadian criminal record. So, this is where that ties in with the age, right? Most people who show up before the courts... Um, a lot of people have some kind of criminal record because there's a lot of repeat business in the courts. And, you know, if you make it to 56 years of age without a criminal record, you've been behaving, you know, relatively well. You've been staying out of trouble. And so that is a, I think this is a strong mitigating factor that the court can identify for his uh, benefit. He doesn't have a whole lot else that he can provide, although, you know, it looks like he's been living aside from this weird sovereign citizen stuff, a fairly quiet life? Well, kind of. So, I mean, he's been getting into a lot of legal fights that he's been picking and losing, but yeah. Counsel for the Crown submits that an appropriate sentence is a concurrent period of incarceration totaling five months followed by probation. Uh, concurrent means that there's sentences that are running at the same time. Um, in Canada, many sentences are run concurrently, and I can probably do a whole video on concurrent versus consecutive sentencing. But because all of these things happened as part of the same package, the court is much more likely to run these concurrently, um, just rather than stacking charges. So on count five, the importing into Canada prohibited devices, that being the magazines, uh, he's asked, the Crown's asking for five months. And then for the prohibited weapons charges, two months, one to two months, one to two months. And for the false statement, he's asking for two months. So when you, if you were to run these consecutively, that would be, looks like almost a year or more than a, I'm not doing math in my head. I'm a lawyer. We, most of us got into it to avoid doing math. Um, but the crown is only asking for five months. All right. So. I'm not going to go through all of the sentencing decisions here because they go and compare a whole bunch of other cases. That could be a whole other video, and this one's going to be a little long. So uh, what the court ultimately decides on is four months, so less than what the Crown asked for, and that's in, uh, in light of Mr. Fern's uh, mitigating factors. They say his moral blameworthiness is high. He's not remorseful uh, based on his applications. And he's got no prior criminal record. But they say we got to exercise restraint. So four months, uh, which is four months on the count five, and then concurrent sentences of one month on each of the other counts. So um, four months in jail. And that would, of course, be served when they find the guy. Now, when you're thinking, hey, this guy's got a U.S. citizenship, are they ever going to find him? Well, spoilers. All right. So they also imposed two years of probation. And the probation terms include keep the peace and be of good behavior, which means don't commit any further crimes. Uh, and that's a mandatory condition on any probation order. Appear before the court when required to do so by the court. So show up for any court dates you have, which is also mandatory. And notify the court or your probation officer in advance of any change of name, address, employment, or occupation. Now we're going to get into some other things of he shall remain within the jurisdiction of the court unless written permission to go outside that jurisdiction is obtained from the court or the probation officer. He's not allowed to leave the country. 
Outside his actual residence, he shall not carry on his person or possess any weapon, including a knife, save to the extent that it is used for culinary or work purposes. This is a very common condition. I don't typically like the wording that comes up in these conditions, but they're basically banning him from any weapons, and they're specifically including knives because knives are not always a weapon. So what they're trying to do here is to basically say that a pocket knife is going to be a breach. Um, I think there's better wording for this, and yeah, I'll say that sort of here and decide whether or not that's its own video topic later. There's a whole lot of potential branches out of this case, but I'm trying to keep it to less than two hours, and we'll see. Uh, no contact or communication, direct or indirect, with any justice of the Alberta Court of Appeal or of the Alberta Court of Queen's Bench or any judge of the Alberta Provincial Court or any prosecutor, Canada Border Services officer or employee, or any person who is providing services related to the administration of justice, except when he is legally required to do so, or through legal counsel or pursuant to subsequent court order. I think this one is a bit much, and I think that there should have been an exception, further exception here, um, for uh, legal filings, because it doesn't seem like there is that uh, exception here, and this could be taken as banning him from appeals unless he's got a lawyer. I don't like that. Um, as much as this guy might be a what they call a paper terrorist, um, he should still be able to appeal his matters. Um, but regardless, what they're really aiming at here is to stop him from harassing any of these people. And I mean, a condition along those lines is probably appropriate, but I, I'm quibbling with the wording. Um, he shall attend for assessment and complete to the satisfaction of his probation officer such counseling as may be recommended by his probation officer, which may include but is not limited to psychiatric or psychological counseling. I'm also unsure on this one because there are times when this is appropriate, but uh, the Meads and Meads decision, which is the sort of governing case on all of this, notes that most of these people are not actually mentally ill. They behave very strangely, and especially strangely from the perspective of the court. But I don't know if there's enough to actually get us that there's a mental illness thing here. Um, but, I mean, fair enough. Uh, he shall not consume or possess any alcohol or intoxicating substance or any substance within the meaning of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, except as prescribed by a medical or dental practitioner. Um, and he shall not permit or allow any alcoholic beverage or intoxicating substance or substance within the meaning of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act to be in his approved residence unless prescribed by a medical or dental practitioner. I'm like, these ones I'm kind of like, why? Um, there's no indication that he was drunk or drugged at any point in this, and probation conditions can include punishment elements, but they should be related to the offense in some fashion, and... Like, I'm not really sure why that was imposed. Um, this is, I think, grounds where a, you know, where a lawyer could have made an appeal to say, listen, um, some of the stuff in this probation order just, you know, should this have been imposed? And I can't say for certain what a court of appeal would have said or not said about this one. But I think there's an argument there, certainly. Um, there's a victim fine surcharge, which they note is payable within 60 days. All of the items were seized uh, to be forfeited to the crown, so he doesn't get his magazines back and he doesn't get his uh, blowguns or push daggers. He also gets a 10-year uh, firearm prohibition, which is uh, the max there. So, And he says, I will consider that this is in the interest of the safety of the public. Um, that one's probably justified just based on the circumstances because, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, the guys behaved real badly in terms of what he was doing there. Um, the other thing I will point out here, and this one kind of just annoys me a little bit, although not a huge amount. They say both the number and type of prohibited devices and weapons is an aggravating factor, so makes it worse. The magazines were designed for an AK-47 assault rifle. Well, I mean, that's not the only thing that they'll fit into. Um, it is hard to imagine a peaceful purpose to which these items could be put. This is the place where courts annoy me because they, you shouldn't be relying on your imagination. Um, this is a point that the court should be insisting on actual evidence on because yes, these can be put to a peaceful purpose. People would be using magazines like this for target practice all the time. Um, 
They were certainly not found in a state where it could uh, reasonably be concluded that they were for a benign purpose, such as a collector. It seems more likely that they were for the purpose of distribution or possessed in support of his declaration of war. I mean, there's all sorts of good reasons here to say it's concerning in his particular circumstances, you know, because he's threatening the border services guards. But, you know, this, the courts will often do this language of like, well, I can't, you know, I can't imagine, or they'll just say based on nothing that there's, you know, that there's no legitimate purpose for a particular, you know, firearm or weapon. And I'm just like, hmm, um, I feel like this is something that the court should be less willing to take judicial notice of and that the judicial notice that they take of these things is often improper. I would love to see a case on this, um, but we haven't seen one. Um, this goes as far as the Supreme Court of Canada has done this. So I got a bit of a rant on that one. All right. So um, let's, I know this is a long video and, you know, if you're saying, hey, I already know what happens to Mr. Fern, um, you kind of already know, or almost already know yet. But I do want to look at his, the stuff in Queen's Bench, because that's where we really start to get some insight in a different way into what's going on in this guy's head, because the provincial court decisions include basically none of his own writings and Queen's Bench gets a little more specific. So we can see a little bit of what he's up to and yeah. So let's have a look. So we know Mr. Fern's been sentenced to jail, but at this point in the story, we haven't seen if he's actually gonna do any because he's got Canadian and American citizenship. The question is, do they find him? But I want to look at something that's a little out of chronological order because as was mentioned in the provincial court decision, he tried to go to Queen's Bench to stop there from being a trial at all, which was a novel strategy. Let's see how this works out for him. All right, so this is Fern and Canada Customs in the Court of Queen's Bench and uh, the decision of Justice, uh, is it Tilleman or Tileman? Anyway, uh, this was mentioned in the provincial court decision, so we'll have a look at it as we go here. Now, it's real long, so I'm going to just look at some select snippets here just to uh, try to keep this from being a three-hour video. So, on or about October 11th, 2013, Glenn Winningham Fern had an incident. That's a, that's a nice way of describing it. Entering the Canadian border. He was detained and arrested by officers at the Canada Border Services Agency, the CBSA. That incident resulted in weapons charges laid against the petitioner. Those charges are currently in the provincial court, the border action, where the presiding judge entered a not guilty plea on behalf of the petitioner. Trial is scheduled for March 3rd to 6th, 2014. And they note that he's a litigant who employs organized pseudo-legal commercial argument uh, concepts and schemes. So this is language from the case of Meads and Meads, which I want to cover one day, but it's 700 paragraphs, so that'll be a big epic undertaking. So they describe those as, in brief, these are legal sounding techniques that allegedly permit persons to avoid practically any obligation from income tax to child support payments, opt out of government control, unilaterally define what is the law, set fines for conduct an individual does not like, and pay bills out of secret birth bond bank accounts. And they continue on to say, OPCA schemes never work. OPCA concepts are no more than flights of conspiratorial fancy and wish fulfillment. Sadly, individuals who employ OPCA techniques, OPCA litigants, are twofold victims. First, of their own imprudence, and second to the con men who market these schemes on a commercial basis to the desperate, foolish, and greedy. Now, when they're talking about people who market these schemes, keep in mind, I already showed you, Mr. Fern sells these techniques to anyone who, or at least he did at one point, I don't even know if he's still alive, to be honest, but, you know, he's one of these guys who will offer to teach you all of his secrets to be just as successful in court as he is. All right, let's uh, have a look at some other aspects here. So this Queen's Bench application is Mr. Fern's attempt to halt the provincial court proceedings. He advances a number of alternative remedies this court is asked to consider and grant. This, the application is best described as unorthodox and was supported by a large volume of materials, most in a document titled Notice of Objection and Non-Consent to Your Roman Civil Law by Affidavit, which they're going to call the notice hereafter. 
which attached and referenced many lengthy items. So this is really common for these kinds of guys, and I'm not going to go through all of the materials he filed, but I will link each of these cases in the description below. Uh, this one is uh, will be sort of noted as the first Queen's Bench application, and you can check it out. They've got a whole bunch of his filings in the appendix. Uh, that could be an entire other video, is just going through that. Um, maybe that'll be something I do on a live stream or something, just so that I can drink as I do it. All right. Uh, the Crown counters that Mr. Fern's arguments are, one, legally incorrect organized pseudo-legal commercial argument schemes, as defined in mean, Meads. Uh, so Meads basically identifies a lot of the tactics these guys use and says they're crap and that the court should not entertain them. And in fact, should actively punish uh, attempts to rely on this kind of uh, nonsense. So two, a collateral attack upon the provincial court proceeding. And what a collateral attack means is that usually there's sort of a proper way of challenging something. In particular, say if there's a provincial court trial, the proper way to run the trial is in the course of the trial. A collateral attack is when you come at something from sort of another direction and you're trying to essentially uh, undo what another court is doing through a sort of an improper process. So what they're saying is you shouldn't have brought this. You should be arguing this in the queen or in the provincial court case. And three, otherwise legally or procedural incorrect or defective in form. So that's uh, sort of more technical issues. The Crown requested Mr. Fern's future filing with the court be restricted and an award of costs made in response to this inappropriate application. So filing restriction means basically that uh, you get put on a, a list where any filing you make, has you have to actually apply for advance permission to file things with the court. It's a really bad thing to happen because... You know, the court is your avenue for remedies if you've been wronged. And so if you get limited in that way, it can be very difficult to uh, to deal with things, at least if you end up with legal matters. So in an award of costs, they're basically saying not only should this guy be sent away, but it should hurt, you know, come after his money too. So this matter raises four general issues. One, should Mr. Fern receive the remedies he seeks? Two, whether Mr. Fern's access to the court should be restricted, and if so, in what manner. Three, should costs be ordered against Mr. Fern in the event his application is unsuccessful. And just as a note, normally you would, you know, you'd win the case and then you'd argue about costs. The fact that they're considering costs and filing restrictions at the stage, you know, that they're at kind of doesn't bode well for Mr. Fern's chances in this particular application. What other court response or responses are appropriate to Mr. Fern's litigation, documents, and in-court statements? Basically, anything else that we should do about this guy? Because he's a bit of a problem. All right, so he seeks a whole bunch of things in order to end this uh, suit, and or the, to end the uh, the provincial court, you know, charges. So one, an order of prohibition against Canada Customs. Uh, Two, an order vacating the decisions made by Canada Customs on October 23rd, uh, or 11th of October 2013, uh, when they unlawfully arrested the petitioner and all subsequent orders and decisions as void and a nullity. Three, an order of non-suit in the provincial court uh, proceedings. And four, an order staying the provincial court proceedings. He also seeks compensation for alleged misconduct by government actors. And uh, so he wants a whole pile of money. Uh, and he actually specifies just how much he's looking for, and he says that he intends to seek damages from certain Crown and court actors, but that will occur via other separate litigation. All right, so uh, carrying on here, the Crown's response uh, is, so Mr. Benkendorf, on behalf of the Federal Crown, and for a while he was sort of a guy who ended up having to deal with a lot of these, argues Mr. Ferns, uh, is clearly a litigant who advances OPCA arguments as surveyed and distilled in Associate Chief Justice Rook's decision in Meads. As I mentioned, Meads and Meads is the basically the granddaddy case of putting an end to sovereign citizen and freeman on the land and this kind of argument. Uh, for a while, this was clogging up the courts because the courts didn't really know what to do with somebody who comes in 
and starts arguing gibberish. Like, how do you deal with that? And so Meads basically said, well, we got to we got to stop entertaining this stuff. This is just ridiculous. So they go on to say, on top of that, he is the representative sovereign citizen slash man litigant actually referred to by name in Meads. So that's kind of exciting, isn't it? I mean, they actually, not only is he, not only is Meads and Meads relevant to him, but he's actually, he gets a special little shout out in Meads. So let's have a look at that special little shout out that uh, that he gets because, yeah, it's of all the cases to get a shout out in, this is pretty much the worst one. It, there is no better uh, or there is no worse case to be specifically mentioned uh, by name in. All right. So just one second here. Uh, there we go. All right, so sovereign men or sovereign citizens, and this is from the Meads decision. So at paragraph 176, the sovereign man slash sovereign citizen movement is the chief U.S. OPCA community. Several reported Ontario decisions document court interactions with self-identified sovereign men. This court has had a limited exposure to sovereign men, most notably being a lawsuit advanced by, guess who? Glenn Winningham, usually self-styled as Glenn Winningham. House of Fern in Winningham v. Canada. So, here we go. Now, this is especially funny because this is uh, Justice Rook speaking here about his experience with this person directly, with Mr. Fern. I was a defendant in this action, so Fern sued Justice Rook, along with Canada, Alberta, many police officers, the Prime Minister, government ministers, the lieutenant and governor generals, and Alberta Court of Queen's Bench Chief Justice Whitman. Whenever you see these lawsuits that basically sue everybody in existence, and especially when they start throwing in random politicians, you know they're they're pretty bad. Um, that is just, that's probably a fairly universal rule. So this action alleged broad conspiracy and misconduct by Canadian state actors. A chief complaint by Winningham, who is a self-declared member of the Republic of Texas, is that Canada Customs had refused to admit him into Canada with his firearms. This was followed by a number of confrontations with Lethbridge area peace officers, particularly at traffic stops. Winningham's documents claim that he is not subject to Canadian law on everything is a contract and courts apply admiralty law bases. So these are sort of flavors of gibberish that the Meads decision identifies and basically debunks and says that the court should not uh, entertain in any way. He also claims governments are only corporations. The allegations and rhetoric in his court submissions express a perspective that is alarming. And we'll come to what he says here in a little bit here because it's quoted in several of the decisions. But yeah, um, so he gets a special little shout out in Meads, which um, that's a hell of a thing overall. It's, uh, you know, Meads is, as I have said a few times here, it was a, a major decision in terms of uh, basically streamlining, throwing these matters out. And courts weren't really sure, sort of, they were all sure that this was gibberish, but they weren't really sure of exactly what steps to take about the gibberish. And so Meads kind of gave a roadmap to that. All right. So the, uh, the 2014 decision, uh, also, or the Queens bench decision that we were just looking at also talks a little bit about Mr. Fern's litigation history. And so, uh, these are all cases that he lost and lost badly. So, uh, so Fern in Canada, the court confirms the lower court was correct to strike out the action. Uh, Glenn Winningham, uh, Fern, uh, and House of or Ontario Hydro Services, the court confirms the lower court was correct to strike out the action. Winningham in USA, again, uh, that action is uh, dismissed with prejudice, so done. Uh, Winningham in USA denied certiorari, again, denied petition for rehearing. Uh, he sued in another case here in 2008, saying that he should not be charged court fees and be allowed to proceed in forma pauperis, which uh, 
basically because you're supposed to have access to the court, um, the, what this is, and we've got similar things here in Canada. You know, if you want to file a lawsuit, it costs some money. You know, they charge you fees just to cover the costs of filing and all of that. But if you are actually des destitute, you know, if you're homeless, if you are really, you know, living just hand to mouth, uh, you can go in and ask the court to say, listen, I don't have the money for the filing fees, but I've been genuinely wronged. I need access to the court. And so the court will say, okay, um, we, you know, assuming that they find that these things are true, uh, they should allow you to proceed without paying filing fees so that you can still, you know, defend yourself or represent your interests. So, uh, continuing on with this one, he filed a financial affidavit that states he and his family members were not persons, but sovereign living souls that he works, but is not employed and has property, but no assets. He therefore refused to provide information on his income and assets. Mr. Fern's application was dismissed for want of prosecution. And they note here, the substance of Mr. Fern's litigation is not apparent. That's the case in a lot of these, because a lot of these are dismissed and they didn't give written decisions as to what they were about. However, his lawsuit includes a diverse range of 49 defendants, including President George W. Bush, Vice President Dick Cheney, Prime Minister Stephen Harper, Premier Ed Stelmack, as well as many other politicians, the Internal Revenue Service, International Monetary Fund, the Bank of England, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Incorporated, and that's in quotation marks, uh, don't sue me, <laughs> church, this is a quote, uh, a number of U.S. states, the Hudson's Bay Company, Canada, Incorporated, same thing, although I'm less worried about Canada, uh, Her Majesty the Queen, Incorporated, I don't think she's going to come after me, uh, Province of Alberta Incorporated, maybe a little more likely. Uh, Regina Incorporated, not a thing. The Parliament of Canada Incorporated, okay, now we're just getting silly. The Queen and Right of Incorporated. <laughs> the Supreme Court of the United States and Queen Elizabeth II personally. So you see what I mean about uh, when you see these lawsuits that just kind of shotgun out over anyone they think is important. They're not good lawsuits. I mean, that isn't to say that there might not be situations where you might have, you know, grounds to sue a particular, you know, person. If Stephen Harper runs over your dog intentionally, you might have a claim. But, you know, that you're probably not also going to include the International Monetary Fund in that one. All right. So I'm going to start skimming over here because they, uh, they kind of get a little repetitive. But you can see it just keeps going here as, you know, they find that his uh, things are clearly basis, bizarre conspiracy theories. Uh, but yeah, here's one where they, this is quoting from Meads here, just so that we can get a little bit of a flavor of uh, what kind of things he's filing with the courts. Just so that we can get a taste of Mr. Fern's uh, particular variety of genius. So, and I'm just going to be quoting here, you know, I've tried to use administrative procedure against these criminals, but they don't get the message. So this is the message. If they want to perjure their oaths of office and engage in treason, capital letters, and sedition, capital letters, and breach of trust, capital letters, and other crimes too numerous to list against me, capitalized, that they better, capital letters, be prepared to go all the way. I'm going to stop saying capital letters, but you can see it for yourself here. And murder me as well, because by the time I am done with them, I will do it all within the law. They will wish I had mur or they had murdered me. It is my patriotic duty to come after them with my or to my last dying breath, and I will file commercial liens against them. I will liquidate their bonds. I will file criminal complaints against them and their bosses. I will seize their assets, and I will not rest until I see them do that little dance they do at the end of a common law rope. And even then, in the next life, I will be demanding justice before the judgment bar of God to make sure they get to spend the rest of eternity receiving their just reward. Also, after I am dead and gone on to the next life, because this is on record, these criminals will be hunted down just like the Nazi war criminals that are still hunted down uh, this day. Furthermore, these criminals are hereby put on notice that with criminals like them in the world, I have a death wish because this world is not big enough for both of us. So go ahead and make my day. The sooner I'm out of here, the better. And I shall exercise my God-given right to resist their unlawful arrest with lethal force if necessary. And then they will have an excuse to murder me. So go ahead, criminals, make my day. 
unbreaded. Yeah. Um, this is a really bad thing to send to the court. I mean, the court's not going to like this. And this is just crazy town. So, yeah, that sort of gives you an example of what kind of stuff he files or has filed in the past. All right. And it just keeps going in terms of his, uh, you know, his arguments with the court being less and less uh, pleased with his stuff there. But the court sort of summarizes this and says, I believe it is fair to observe that one rarely encounters a litigant who is so vigorous and meritless across so many jurisdictions. He keeps filing stuff all over the place and he always loses. And he'll sell you his secrets. You too can learn to be a success. Yeah, I, I just, it boggles my mind that anyone would pay for that. Other noteworthy elements that emerge from this case survey are that Mr. Fern habitually, one, does not pay court fees, Two, sues lawyers, court staff, and judges who were involved in previous matters. Three, litigates matters that courts repeatedly identify as hopelessly flawed and incorrect, and advances legal theories that are completely Ill illegitimate, if not incomprehensible. Four, requests remedies that are clearly beyond that which are reasonable, or which fall outside the court's authority. Five, continues litigation that is identified as fundamentally flawed until he exhausts all appeal options. Six, uses language that is intemperate and offensive, like suggesting that, he, you know, that they're going to have the various judicial officials hanged. That's kind of a, that's an example of intemperate and offensive, both in court and is in his court materials. And seven, makes allegations that are flatly rejected as ungrounded and of an un obviously false, ridiculous, conspiratorial character. So they note, this application is frivolous and vexatious, because this application is therefore an exercise in deja vu. Mr. Fern raises incredulous allegations. His in-court claims were riddled with hyperbole and scandalous and unsupported claims. To name only a few, he says the courts are selling their so-called justice, that the Canadian Border Service Agency workers are nothing but criminals. As for their conduct, it is kind of like organized crime, and lawyers are foreign agents of the Vatican. Now, I included this because I love this little bit here. This is great because, man, I wish I was a foreign agent of the Vatican. They get all sorts of cool stuff. They're issued MP7s. They're issued automatic rifles. And they get a halberd. I mean, I don't have a halberd. I don't have a pike. I don't have any sort of pole arms. Um, I mean, when do I get this stuff if I'm supposedly a foreign agent of the Vatican? I could really use a halberd. So... Yeah, maybe I should talk to my sword and knife guy about if he can make me a halberd just so that I can really have some fun with this one. <laughs> All right, so you can see here there's, uh, you know, some stuff here. Crown is suggesting a cost award of $4,000, which they don't get because uh, I think ultimately the court kind of feels that it's uh, a little bit like, you know, kicking an injured puppy. So they don't... Uh, they don't go ahead and do that. Um, they also quote a little bit more of the notice that uh, that was in this material here to illustrate the extreme manner in which Mr. Fern expresses himself. And this is, again, mentioning specifically Justice Rook, who is, you know, a justice of the Court of Queen's Bench. So Rook knows that these Canada Customs thieves ass assaulted me and kidnapped me and falsely imprisoned me because the director of the Lethbridge Correctional Center came to see me at approximately 1 a.m. in the morning when they took me there and said, uh, why are there so many chiefs of police that are so happy to see you in here? And these Canada Customs thieves woke Rook up in the middle of the night to give him the great news that they had assaulted me and kidnapped me and falsely imprisoned me. And now Rook, Windsor, Johnson, Harper, Ethel, Redford, and Whitman are all celebrating and sending each other gifts to celebrate their assaults and kidnapping and false imprisonment, and they intend to murder me. And the proof of that is that they have converted my proper application with their Roman civil law, Capitus de Initio. That's this thing that they, that sovereign citizens get really upset about is whether or not your name is capitalized or not. Now, in a lot of court documents, they capitalize names because it's easier to read and you want to get the names right. That's the only reason that gets done, but they think this is some magical significance here. So, uh, continuing on here, they say, into a dead thing called, and this is all caps, because this is what he's talking about here, this is important that it's all caps, uh, Glenn Winningham Fern, 
and the Vatican Jesuit Masonic Bencher is working with them to help them complete their justice. And all of this was precipitated by Rook and Langston and Redford three years ago when I had the audacity to think I might get some justice before their uh, bencher buddy Langston and further, and it continues on. And they note that the emphasis, so the capitalization and the underscoring is all in the original. This guy clearly has an over, you know, a bit of an inflated sense of his own importance because I guarantee you, Nobody is waking up a justice in the middle of the night to say, hey, we we arrested a guy. Uh, nobody's going to bother a justice because they like their sleep and nobody really is going to like this just doesn't happen. So, yeah, uh, I am going to quote a little bit further from this decision just to note one thing that I think is worth uh, looking here, which is that many of the people who fall into this trap are deserving of some sympathy. And I don't know if that applies to Mr. Fern because he's trying to draw other people into the same crap he's in. But lots of people come to this because their life has become very difficult in various ways. So just quoting here from the uh, this decision, they say the reported case law only hints at the additional grief caused when litigants attempt to apply these strategies, often in response to extreme stress. And they quote a uh, an article or a paper about these guys. And so in Meads at paragraph 161, Rook identifies a range of examples where it appears individuals in extreme distress have adopted these futile strategies. For example, during a home foreclosure, a bankruptcy, or to avoid deportation. Subsequent to that decision, the courts have reported more of the same. So foreclosures and children being seized by their, uh, by their parents, uh, this only hints at the misery aggravated by the concept sold by OPCA gurus. And, you know, as mentioned, when they say gurus, they mean people who are trying to teach this stuff as if it was truth. Mr. Fern is one of those. Or was at the time of this decision. I don't know what he's doing now. Uh, trial judges in this jurisdiction regularly encounter desperate persons who squander the remaining limited resources on futile OPCA responses. And that's really what is most sad about a lot of these things is that they have genuine legal issues. And, you know, Meads and Meads was a family law case. Uh, the guy, you know, people, family law cases are stressful. There's a lot of, you know, tension. You get people who are losing their house because they're running out of money. You get all sorts of issues that people have. And then they decide that this stuff is the answer because somebody sold them a line of goods. Somebody told them that this would help and they lose everything. It's really tragic. So that's why I have really less sympathy or very little sympathy for Mr. Fern because he's not just a guy who got roped in. He's a guy who's uh, actively trying to make a buck um, selling this to others. And that is tragic. So um, we're at about an hour and a half here. So I'm just going to really quickly look at the final st chapter in this, which is again in the Court of Queen's Bench. And this is again a decision of Justice uh, Tilleman or Tileman. And so this one tells us what ultimately happens with Mr. Fern, because, you know, there was that open question of, do they end up finding him in jail? Like, what goes on? So, introduction. This decision responds to documents received by the court from Glenn Winningham Fern, contrary to an order of this court made January 13th, 2014. So, because they said, you can't file stuff without permission, he went ahead and filed stuff without permission. And also reported in a subsequent written decision, and they give the citation there. So, on April 7th, 2014... Uh, they received a handwritten document from Mr. Fern entitled Petition for a Writ of Habeas Corpus. And habeas corpus is a thing, uh, but it doesn't really apply here, as the court's going to mention. A transcribed version of the petition is attached as Exhibit B. And again, I'm going to link this case so you can see it for yourself if you want to see exactly what's there. I've given you a little taste of what he writes, but you can see the full details there. Um, so they previously had observed that Mr. Fern is uh, what is called an OPCA litigant, specifically a sovereign citizen. I also pointed out his lengthy litigation history, prominent in its vigor and lack of merit. I love that turn of phrase. Prominent in its vigor and lack of merit. Unfortunately, as this decision indicates, Mr. Fern continues to document and file spurious, illogical, and unlawful uh, beliefs. So he hasn't been slowed down. 
Now, so he went and, as mentioned, you know, he tried to stop the trial from happening. The trial happened in his absence after he walked out of the trial. And um, now he's filing this writ of habeas corpus. And that's because, uh, and I'm just trying to find the, uh, the key detail here. Mr. Fern was apprehended on March 10th, 2014 in Calgary and at present is located in the Lethbridge Correctional Center. So they did find him and they did, uh, uh, they did, uh, you know, wrap this up. Now, ultimately, you know, he files this writ and they say habeas corpus is not available to him. The proper remedy and, you know, I'm just, you know, noting that this is long and this video is long. They note that the proper remedy would have been to file a, you know, a standard appeal. What he wants to do is appeal, not seek a writ of habeas corpus, which is a bit of a different thing. So ultimately, he's unsuccessful with all of that. He does not, uh, you know, he doesn't gain anything by filing that. And so my suspicion is that he probably served out his full sentence. There's not full details on that. But um, yeah, it's just uh, that's at the end of the day, what he gets out of all of this is jail time and probation and you know various other sanctions so um i guess i've kind of harped on this a little bit but uh, it is really tragic not only that mr fern got himself into this state where this is what he thinks is a reasonable course of action and a proper approach to the judicial system because you can see how well it worked out for him which is not at all well like nobody is ever gonna say hey i I really want to end up, you know, not just getting jailed, but also the court is not kind to him in this decision. I mean, their, their criticism is pretty blunt. So, but he markets this and he's trying to convince, and there's, it's not just him, you know, there's other people out there who are trying to convince people that this is some magic, you know, answer. And people say, oh, well, lawyers are involved in some conspiracy and they want to hide, hide the truth and all of this. And I'm like, do you not think that if there was some way that I could suddenly not pay income tax and own any gun I wanted and, you know, do anything I wanted that I would be all over that? Like, I would absolutely. The problem is, is that, you know, the only way that happens is crime. And these strategies are basically crime plus self-delusion, which works to just be crappier, worse crime. Um, you know, we can see an example of that because like people who are actually trying to smuggle guns across the border because they're involved in, you know, organized crime, they don't do things like send a letter to Canada Customs going, hey, um, by the way, I reserve the right to murder you guys. So just so you're aware and so that you're super, you know, on the ball and super, you know, aware of any time I cross the border. I mean, that that's not a winning strategy for smuggling. It's when you actually break down what happens here, it's unfathomable that people would act this way. It just makes no sense. But people get so twisted around in this stuff and it's a lot of it is wishful thinking. You know, as they note, there's people who are in desperate, dire circumstances. They really want this to be true and they really hope that this offers them an answer. And ultimately, all they get out of it is is hurt. So... Yeah, that is the story of Glenn Winningham Fern. I don't know what he's up to nowadays. Um, he was somewhat advanced in years in 2014. He's going to be more advanced in years at this point, so I don't know what he's up to. Maybe he's retired from this. Maybe he's learned his lesson and moved away from it. Because I noted on Amazon, all of those you know materials were no longer available. I don't know if that's Amazon pulled them or he pulled them. Maybe he, Maybe he's learned. I don't know. Um, or, you know, he might've passed on. I don't know what's happened to him. Heck, if you know what's happened to him, let me know in the comments below. I'm kind of curious. 
Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope that this has been interesting. I mean, it's kind of funny, but I also hope that it's been, you know, every once in a while somebody reaches out to me and they are kind of flirting with these ideas. They're not like some people send me, you know, hate mail because they're like way deep in this. They're, you know, and they've got all sorts of opinions. And yeah, that's, you know, people who are a little bit beyond the, you know, but sometimes people reach out to me and they're just like, well, I've heard that this might be a thing. What do you say about that? And I hope some of those people, at least, you know, one, I will consider this video to be an absolute win if at least one of those people watches this and goes, oh, yeah, I don't want that for me. Um, I don't want that for the people around me. This, you know, Mr. Fern had a really bad day and has had 20 really bad days in court at least. So that's my hope, um, that somebody watches this and thinks better of this whole line of, this whole way of existing. Anyway, thank you for watching. Uh, please like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe to see more content. I know it's real long, but I try to mix them up with between the long and the short videos. So a little bit of everything there. Anyway, um, I also want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, Canada's National Firearms Association, the CCFR, and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association, at the $30 level, Sights and Arms Limited, and Mark Olivier Damour, and at the $20 level, Peter Hilger, Mark Whittington, Jane Babe and Luxor, Haywire, Dale Nesbitt, Cameron Johnson, Bruno R., Andrew Elsich, and Aaron Del So. Thank you as well to everyone at the $10 level who will be in the crawl immediately following. Um, you can also check me out on Locals if, uh, if that's more your speed. I've got a couple of cases that I want to cover that I probably can't put on YouTube. Um, and so those will have to go on Locals only because, you know, I, YouTube will be very upset. And, you know, some of these are really important uh, decisions, including um, I, somebody asked me to cover Keegstra, which is a case about uh, free speech but it's a case about free speech in the context of somebody whose speech is really pretty toxic. So, um, you know, the, where, where the Canadian courts have decided the line is on free speech. And I got my own issues with the idea of there being a line, but this is what the law says. Um, I'm still deciding whether I want to cover Sharp, which is kind of a uh, a bad pictures case, although it's actually one that covers uh, writings rather than photographs. So, uh, I don't know. Let me know in the comments below if that's one you want me to cover, but if I do, it's going to be locals only just because of, yeah, it's it's an ugly case, but a lot of criminal law deals with ugly stuff. Um, there's also one that I'm looking at covering that deals with uh, border crossings. And again, it's a border crossings case in the context of bad pictures. And you note know, that I'm tiptoeing around terms here because the uh, YouTube will not be happy. So yeah, let me know if those are cases you'd like to see. And if so, um, that's where they'll be available. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope this has armed you with knowledge. Uh, a couple other things I do want to cover and will be covering in the near future. Uh, British Columbia is engaging in some of the shenanigans that were rejected here in Alberta. Um, thanks in part to folks like yourself. So I'm really hoping that uh, we can do for British Columbia what's, you know, what's happened with Alberta. And... Uh, also, the government is moving to restrict um, online news in various ways. And so I'm going to go through that bill and talk about um, the good, the bad, and lots of ugly, because there's a whole lot of ugly on that one. All right. Thank you for watching. See you next time.